Hello guys and girls and welcome back to another episode of Seb Talk Sports. Sponsored by Memsham UK. The place to go to for brand new, authentic, signed NFL memorabilia. That intro music and podcast theme was created by all pro New York Giants running back, now music creator and friend of the show, David Wilson. Go and check him out on all of his social media platforms at 4stillrunning on Twitter and Instagram and his music under David E. Wilson across all good music streaming services. He's free for business so drop him a message if you want some beats for your podcast, adverts, commercial absolutely anything you need before i get into this episode i just want to say that if you're not already following seb talk sports across all platforms then please do you can find me on facebook seb talk sports youtube seb talk sports twitter at seb talk sports and instagram where i'm primarily active again it's at seb talks sports today i've got another great guest it's another throwback episode to an interview i did this summer with the world famous harlem wizard center who's been traveling the world as part of a very special team entertaining fans in every corner of the globe and a man currently working on an incredibly special project that you'll hear about during this interview it's the one and only tj tomahawk stooks enjoy My guest today is a professional basketball player and centre for the world-famous Harlem Wizards, who has been high-flying and dogging across the globe as part of a team that holds the second-longest winning streak in all of professional sports. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome TJ Stooks to Step Talk Sports. TJ, how you doing? I'm all good, man. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you so much for coming on today. So let's go right back to the beginning. So what are your earliest memories of playing sport and basketball in particular? And how did you end up choosing basketball as a career as opposed to any other sport? Okay, so, you know, as a typical athlete, everybody starts young. Me, I didn't start playing basketball when I was young. I started playing basketball seriously when I was 16. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. and before then, I did play football and baseball, but wasn't very proficient at it. But I did play it. Um, the reason why, because I didn't want to follow my father's footsteps. And I wanted to make, solidify my own career and my own, because my father was well known in the New York street ball circuit. Mm. And I didn't want to be under his shadow. I wanted to create my own. The first time I remember even trying to play basketball, I got dunked on hard, <laughs> really, really hard. And um, my competitive spirit, it never failed me. So I was like, that's never happening again. So I, I, I got, I concentrated. I actually worked out with a few people. I didn't know what I was doing when I was working out, but I'm a um, visual learner. Mm. So just mimic the action. And I looked at Kevin Garnett, Kenyon mm-hmm. Martin, Mm-hmm. You know, and I studied their game and I was obs- almost obsessed with getting better. Mm-hmm. And so the year from 16 to 17, I was approached to play with the AAU team with Kevin Hamilton. He played for Iona. He won the championship ring with Larry Bird. Just because I was tall, I went from 5'9", 16 to 6'8", 17. And so, <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's crazy. When that happened. They, I was working at Hollywood Video. It was a rival to Blockbuster Video. Mm-hmm. And it was like, do you want to play basketball? I was like, okay whatever I guess you don't have to pay anything and then it was like no you don't and then um lo and behold when I walked into the gym everybody looked at me like I was good which I wasn't and then um one of my teammates was Joe Kim Noah mm. so um you know like I'm looking at him like wow he is tall and lanky mm. and then I got dunked on again <laughs> and then I said you know what I gotta figure out a way to get better and then each year that progressed I locked in and, and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I mean, I got good. Mm. I, I mean, like, because I worked so hard at it, though. Mm. And then the first time I got attention was when I jumped over somebody in the AAU game. <laughs> like, it was four minutes left in the game, mm. and the game was done. Nobody <laughs> wanted to play anymore. <laughs> after playing in high school, you then went on to play college ball at Independence Community College and then Pitt State after winning two high school titles earlier in your career. So how much did you enjoy your time before turning pro? And what lesson that you learned during your time at college is most valuable now as a wizard? Okay, so the most, wow, that's a very good question. <laughs> the most valuable lesson that I've learned in college is I am not the best. There's always somebody better than me. Mm. There's, always, there's always somebody working harder than me. And I thought, you know, because I was the man in high school and going into college, I'm not the man no more. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and so I had to learn how to humble myself. Mm. I had to learn really fast. In college, I wasn't the most skilled, but I was the hardest worker. Mm. And then we did okay my freshman year. But my sophomore year, I was determined. I was mm. so determined to do better and lead correctly. So my second year, we lost our first three games. Mm. And so I challenged my team to reel it in and become a team because mm. I, we only had four sophomores 
and the rest was freshmen. So they were young, the same way I was, mm. you know, like brash, immature. And so I challenged them. I said, listen, we are a great team. We need to be great mm. today, not tomorrow. And I thank my coach so much. His name is Coach DeSalm. He reeled us in, and we ended up winning 27 straight. Ooh. We didn't lose from end of October to mid-March. Ooh. It was a ride that I would never forget. Mm. We beat from number five to number 25, ranked Ooh. in the country. Wow. In, in junior college. And then Pitt State, that was so humbling because mm. in my entire career, it was short, but my entire career, I was always winning. That's the first time I felt defeat. Mm. And we did less than average, but we had a good team and we had moments that were great, but it was only moments. Mm. So that was humbling. And I learned how to reel my emotions in because the, the two people I followed most was Kevin Garnett and Kenyon Martin. Yeah. And you know how passionate they are. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how to relay my passion in the most positive way back then. You know, I was either you follow me or leave. So I learned that that was the, probably the biggest lesson, humbling myself and learning how to be a true leader. Mm. Okay, so after college in 2009, you then, of course, joined the world-famous Harlem Wizards, which for people that don't know, is a team that NBA champion and Hall of Famer Tiny Archibald has played with, among many other ex-NBA talent. And you're also given the nickname Tomahawk. So how did you first hear about the Harlem Wizards and get involved with them? And also, how did you end up with that awesome nickname? <laughs> okay, so uh, in 2009, I was determined, like I said, the, the key word in, in my entire life is being determined. Mm. I felt like I wanted to transfer out of Penn State, but at the same time, I, I knew my work early. Mm. And so when I see my pictures on pamphlets and I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm not getting paid. Mm. Uh, I'm like, what's going on? I'm broke. I'm barely eating. And then I was like, you know, what? I need to make something, something mm. happen now. And then I was offered to play in Oslo, Norway. I was offered mm. to play in Paraguay or Brazil, but I wanted to stay in the United States and take my chance in the NBA. Mm. So when I got an invite to the combine, I went. And like I said, another humbling experience where those guys were on a different level. I was just naturally talented at basketball. I didn't work on anything. The only thing I worked on was skill, not strength, not stamina. Mm. So that was another humbling experience, which I wasn't ready for. I didn't want to play in the D League because I'm like, I could make more doing the nine to five. And mm. so when one of my very good friends, uh, Eric Jones, he was like, you need a job? Come on, we, we pay this and that. We pay good, we travel the country, we travel the world. Mm. And, and I'm like, well, what is it, the system? Is he, you know the Globe Travelers, right? So yeah, he said it's the same thing. Yes, we go to high schools and all that. I'm like, mm. okay, I'll, I'll try out. Yes. So, you know, I excel. And at that time I was like, what the hell am I doing here? Cause they're doing tricks and all that. And I'm like, uh, I'm a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, the dunking, the basketball playing, that's how I got into it. And Tomahawk, I remember one time, it was in Hoops in the Sun. It's a tournament in New York. It's one of the biggest tournaments in, in, in street ball tournaments in New York. And one time, I was running on the fast break, and a guy passed it to me. I didn't even dribble. I just took off, brought the ball down to my foot, and just dunked it so hard, and I bent the rim. Oh, and that rim is difficult to like even move. Mm. And it was like, holy crap. They stopped the game. It was like, what? That was the craziest <laughs> Tomahawk ever. And I was like, Tomahawk, that sounds good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you had your own Shaq moment there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so your colleges and current team have had some great former players. Indy College had NBA players, Armin Gillum, Harvey Grant, Ruby <laughs> And then, like I said, on the Wizards, Nate Archibald, Tiny Archibald. But who would you say mm -hmm. is the best player you've ever played with and against throughout your entire career? Okay, the best I ever played with, rest in peace, Sticks. Nickname is Sticks. He's uh, about 6'9". He was the first person to show me the hard knocks of mm. being good. And he said, this is what it takes. What are you willing to do for it? He's probably the best person I've ever played with. The hardest person I ever played against is probably Ron Artest. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, Meta, I guess, Meta. Yeah. Because he is deceptively strong. Mm. And the thing is, I am strong. I am one of the strongest people on the court at all times. Mm. But he was bullying me. Wow. And I've never been bullied. <laughs> and, and so seeing that raw strength and seeing the gap in between just playing and the NBA level, yeah. again, it's, it's a whole different realm. And then after that year, I promise you, I was like, no more. And I think that's the biggest thing in my life, the resiliency that I have. 
the mm-hmm. fight that I have because I never give up. I'm gonna tell you a funny story. Yeah. You know, uh, Adrian, uh, what's his name? Adrian Brown, the heavyweight champ. They call him Bronze Bomber. Deontay uh, Wilder. Yeah. So we had a game in Tuscaloosa, right? Mm-hmm. His hometown. So we played, and it was one time he he did a spin move, caught me off guard, boom, dunked on my head. Right? <laughs> Listen, I got dunked on, but I respond. I go down the next play, mm-hmm. cross him over, he falls over, Ooh. and then I dunk the ball so hard. He gets so mad, he wants to fight me. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't I don't know who he is. I don't know who he is. But everybody's like, nope, he's a champ. Don't do it. He's a champ. <laughs> and so I'm like, what? A champ for what? And then I see him later on, mm-hmm. and he's like, man, he said, you're the first person not to back down for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the first person not to go at me, not to be scared. <laughs> And he's like, I respect you for that. Mm. He said, I'm sorry, I just have a temper. He scared the hell out of me. Because he's my height. He's my height. Mm, yeah. About pounds heavier than me. Mm. So, like, <laughs> so scary. But that's the story of my resilience. I love it. Okay, so let's talk about the Wizards quickly. So Brooklyn Dodgers promoter uh, Howie Davis, the founder of them, which has traveled across almost all the states in the US and the world, performing in entertaining crowds over 10,000 people. How much do you enjoy the traveling aspect of it? And as a wizard, what state or country and culture did you find most interesting and enjoyable? The traveling got old really fast because we were playing 20 games in 25 days in 20 different places. Wow. So we were constantly on the move, ping ponging around the United States. Yeah. That gets tiring. We drive, so we take turns driving you know, us as the players. And then on top of the driving, we have to go and visit the schools beforehand to promote the game. Mm. So sometimes we have to leave directly after the game and drive five or six hours. Mm. And then wake up at eight in the morning and visit an elementary school or middle school, high school, Mm. and then talk to the kids, which is the most fulfilling part of our job. Yeah. I say the most interesting place, I'm going to say domestic and international. Domestic is probably Indiana. Man, Indiana, they love basketball. Mm-hmm. And when I say they love basketball, they love basketball. One of my favorite, I call it an arena, but it's a high school gym, is Washington, Indiana, because the Zella Brothers play there. And that gym holds 10,000 people. Whew, wow. The high school gym. That's ridiculous. And every time we go there, it's filled up. Mm. From bottom to top, the people appreciate us. And it's just so fulfilling. Even like the basketball part is just making people happy. You know, it's about being a light so somebody else can shine. So I want to, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't answer. International. I've been to China 11 times. Wow. China, man, their basketball culture, they're like, basketball. <laughs> we want to see basketball. And so, you know, like, we, we get to play, we get to have fun. Mm. And I say that the competitive aspect is the funnest thing about going to China. So this year, of course, we very tragically lost Kobe Bryant, NBA icon, mm. five-time champ in a helicopter crash. So as a basketball player, I want to know, what did Kobe mean to you personally? And in your opinion, what legacy will he have on the game of basketball? That's so crazy, because look what I have in my hand. (laughs) No way. Whoa. (laughs) That is so crazy. Whoa. Okay, so what he meant to me, he is one of the players that I secretly loved that I openly hated, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And so his work ethic, I always admire. Mm. And him as the father is what made me love the man he was, Mm -hmm. because he was willing to give up an entire sport. He knew he could play for a number of years more to be a dad. Mm -hmm. And me as a father to an amazing, crazy little girl and a calm, collected young son, Mm -hmm. it means so much more to me than basketball could ever mean. And I thought I'd never say that in my life. And so um, Kobe Bryant, his, the way he approached the game, the way he didn't cheat himself, Mm -hmm. the way he challenged others, that is what he meant to me. Mm. And it crushed me when he passed away. I didn't think that it would have an impact as it did. But I couldn't, I I couldn't for weeks, I couldn't stop thinking about his family. Yeah. Weeks. You know, I found myself crying so much just because of what he gave and how much he wanted to give. And me being a, a woman's coach, a girl's coach, and understanding the aspect of women's basketball, mm-hmm. it meant so much more to me because I rode on that train for so long and to see Kobe Bryant on that train with his Gigi, yeah. it made, it, it like crushed my heart. Mm-hmm. And, and so I tell my girls, just appreciate what you have today, yeah. right now, because it can be gone in an instant. Mm-hmm. And so, God, his gifts, his mentality, I don't know how to describe it, it's just, why wouldn't you want to 
emulate that. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't even have to be with basketball. It can be with anything. You mm-hmm. can focus. I always say the most powerful weapon that a man and woman has is focus. Mm-hmm. And he applied that tenfold. And he was willing to do whatever it took. And that, I think that was his gift to the world. So as well as basketball, I know you've also began acting in recent years as a member of yes. uh, SAG-AFTRA and even started yes. your own YouTube channel where you stream yes. gaming and that kind of thing and filming. <laughs> I love, it's great. So what made you want to get into the entertainment industry as well as basketball? And if they ever made a film about you, who would play TJ Tomahawk Stoops? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to answer these questions in order, okay? Yeah. Okay, what made me get into entertainment? I always knew I was possible of it. I always knew. And I was an extra in the movie Just Right that came out in 2010. Common and Prima Tifa. He was an NBA all-star that injured himself and was coming back to the NBA. Mm. So when I got just a taste of it, I was like, wow, this is it? We just got to do 12 hours a day for four days and that's it. (laughs) This much. Mm. Let's be sure. I'm not stealing (laughs) nothing, right? (laughs) And so, so you know, 12 hours a day for four days is nothing compared to how much I actually work. Mm. So I was like, okay, I know I'm capable of this, but how do I get into it? So I didn't know how to get into it for so long. So I was stagnant and comfortable in my ways until I challenged myself to actually try getting into it. So I auditioned for a Verizon commercial Mm. and I got it. Yeah. So when I did the Verizon commercial and, you know, people seen it, it was played during the NBA finals very briefly. And it was maybe a 15 second spot, Mm. but people saw me. Yeah. And being real, I made a lot of money in a very mm-hmm. short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And so when I was making the money, I said, I think I'm working too hard. Mm. I said, how do I work smarter and get into this area of entertainment, which I've been entertaining for almost nine years already. Yeah. So I just kept putting my name in stuff. And then I got an Adidas commercial. Mm. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. This is yeah. okay. And then I got a Chicago PD. I'm like, mm. this is seven hours. That's it. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm making this much? And then stuff kept going, it was like a snowball effect. Mm. And then I'm like, now maybe if I put my name in bigger stuff, you never know. Mm. I was told no maybe a hundred times over before I was told the one big yes, the two big yeses actually. So one, I'm going to play George Foreman in his biopic. That's a big deal for me. Yeah. I'm training now for it. And the filming starts February and the movie should be out early 2022. The ironic thing that you asked, Mm. my biopic is coming out late 2022 on netflix no way so i don't like honestly to answer your question i have no idea i have (laughs) literally no idea because i'm playing my father it's going to be loosely based you know the truth can't be out there a hundred percent but it'll be about 80 percent truth and 80 percent of the circumstances that i've been through Mm. and then it goes through my mother's life also because her mistakes led a direct ripple effect to my life and my sister's life. So like I said, my life has been full of determination and grit, and I had to persevere and not give up on myself for so long. My mom was incarcerated for 10 years. And so I had to figure out how to raise myself for 10 years from five to 15. So my mom was a professional boxer also. So, you know, like I have the genes in me. Yeah. My dad was one of the top basketball players, like I said, in the street ball, you know, the late 60s to the Mm -hmm. mid 70s. So he played against Will Chamberlain. He played against Tiny Archibald. He played against all of them. And my biopic will explore all that, plus how it affected me to the current. Mm. I'm looking forward to that. That sounds good. So as we're filming this, yesterday was obviously Father's Day, and you shared a great post about uh, your kids on social media, which I love. So firstly, happy Father's Day for yesterday. And secondly, how much does being a dad mean to you, and what challenge does all the traveling with the Wizards pose to that? My my kids literally saved my life. Mm. I was going down a dark road, and they were my light. You know how I said earlier, you have to allow somebody to be a light for somebody else. And they were my light. You know, I was a light to so many people, but... You know, nobody, how do I say it? When you are being a positive light to somebody else, people forget to make sure you're good. Yeah. So I was going down a dark road and my kids literally saved my life. Mm-hmm. And so it means everything to be a dad. Yeah. It means everything. And being there for my kids means much more because my mom wasn't there and it wasn't her fault. My dad wasn't there because he was, you know, he was doing his own. Thing. So I was raising myself, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll be damned that my children go their lives without me by any means necessary. I'll be here no matter what. Yeah. And so the challenge of traveling and having my kids and trying to be there 
it's tough, it's daunting on them. My son is nine, my daughter is six. And they understood at a very early age that daddy's doing what he got to do to make sure you have whatever you want. Because like I said, I was raising myself. And so when my son wants a new video game, I don't care what it takes, he got it. My daughter wants new shoes, I don't care what it takes, she got it. I just make sure to explain to them thoroughly, not as children, but as human beings, what I'm doing. Because my children, their maturity level is going to be so much more because I don't talk to them as children. Mm. I don't talk to them as adults, obviously, but I just make sure they understand what I'm doing at an early age. I don't shield them from the world because yeah. figuratively speaking, I'm putting armor around them, mm -hmm. getting them ready for the world. Yeah. You know, it's just important to me that they understand what I'm doing and they do. And just to make sure that, hey, dad, I have a game coming up. Where are you? Can you come to my game? No matter what. And I got to fly in for 12 hours to watch the game, then fly back out, go right back to work. I don't care I'm doing. So I'm there no matter what. Fantastic. Okay, so the Harlem Wizards have some awesome jerseys. The famous red, blue, and purple ones. And then obviously the special cancer awareness ones for prostate cancer, breast cancer, among a variety of other really cool looking ones. So for you, what's your favorite ever NBA jersey of all time? Whew. Okay, it's not my favorite team, okay? My favorite NBA jersey was the Orlando Magic when Tracy McGrady was on it, the shiny one Ooh. with the stars on it. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. I love that jersey. There was a time in high school, I'm an idiot for this, I used to collect official jerseys, mm. but I used to always go the different player. I never got, like, AI or yeah. Tracy McGrady or, like, Akeem Olajuwon. I got, like, Eric Snow. I got <laughs> – <laughs> I got uh, – <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I got, what's his name? Beatrice, the shooter when he was Orlando. I got Kevin Garnett. That's one thing. But I also got Troy Hudson. What other jerseys? I had uh, the Seattle jersey. I didn't get Sean Kemp. Mm. I didn't get Gary Payton. I got, uh, what's his name? The, the seven-footer. I forgot his name. Oh! I, <laughs> I used to, it was so stupid, but I, like, people used to laugh at me at that. But I never got the main people's jerseys, like the superstars' jerseys. Mm. I used to always look for the off, you know, like, like who's that? You know, mm. like, yeah, because I always wanted to be different. I always went left when everybody went right. That was always me. It's like getting a Steve Kerr jersey as a Bulls fan, that kind of thing. When exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> TJ, you've got to end with some quick five questions. Ready? Okay. Coke or Pepsi? Neither. Neither? Okay. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Twitter or Instagram? Twitter. Favorite takeout food? Whataburger. Biggie or Tupac? Biggie. Favorite sports movie of all time? He got game. Favorite NBA player of all time? Carmelo Anthony. Mm, nice choice. TJ, thank you so much for your time today. I've had a great time chatting with you. Where can people find you on social media? On um, Instagram, HWTomahawk20. Um, I have another page. It's TJ Stukes, no underscore, no space, just one word. On Twitter, it's TJ Stukes84. And on Facebook, also TJ Stukes. Good stuff. I'll make sure to leave all your links below so people can find you easily. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. Thank you. I've had a great time <laughs> talking to you. So um, take care and I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, man. You too. Stuff, and there he goes, the fantastic TJ Tomahawk Stooks. Some great stories there and just one of the nicest guys in the business. I cannot wait to watch those Netflix biopics coming out in 2022 and see TJ playing George Foreman. What an honour and there's not a doubt in my mind he's going to smash it. Make sure to go and follow TJ across all of his social media accounts and keep up to date with his training. All the links you need are in the description of this episode. I've got many more great guests coming very soon, so stay tuned right here on Seb Talks and to take us out as usual, here's another brilliant track by all pro New York Giants running back turned music creator and friend of the show, David Wilson. Catch you soon, guys.